All right, all righty. So in today's video, I'm going to do something special, and that is I'm going to answer your top 10 burning questions regarding credit spreads and iron condors. Now, if you recall, not too long ago, in fact, it was just the beginning of the week, I sent you an email basically to reply back to me, you know, with the single most important question that you like to ask me about options trading that can really help and benefit you right now. So the good news is that I've got a lot of people that actually replied back to me with their questions and I appreciate you for that. I thank you for that. And most of the questions are actually on credit spreads and iron condors. So that is why I decided to make this video, the topic basically just around these two trading strategies. Now, the bad news is that I've got a lot of people actually email me uh, with these uh, questions and I literally have about 100 over emails for this. So I only can choose about, you know, 10 of it because of uh, time constraints and also mainly because, you know, most of the questions are pretty much similar to one another so hopefully you know if i've uh, answered some of the questions uh, today here that you will also answer your question if i did not pick you up for this video all right so let's get right into this so question number one is by garrett whitaker so garrett says hey davis i appreciate your channel and everything uh, hey garrett i appreciate you as well so the one question i have is how would you trade and grow a five thousand dollars account I grew from uh, $2,500 to $17,000, then got greedy and got hit hard during the downturn. I'm now at $5,000. What would you do? I'm not giving up, just very humble. All right, so this is a very good question, Garrett. So the fact that you can actually grow your account from $2,500 to $17,000 is actually pretty remarkable by itself, right? But the thing is that most likely you had to take on pretty big risks, right? Because it's very difficult for you to grow from $2,500 to $17,000 if you do not have a very huge risk per trade on each trade. Right, so as you probably already know by now, this is a double edged sword because you could make a lot, but you could also lose a lot, which is where you're at now, right? Because you say you're now at five thousand dollars. So, here's my answer. So, first off, I would say the first thing that you really need to do is to hone down on your risk management, right? You want to practice proper risk management, and by that, what I mean is that the maximum risk allocation you want to allocate to any single trade should be five to seven percent, right? That should be the maximum, right? In certain cases, you may even push to 10%, right? But that would really be the maximum, right? Basically, if you have a small account, I understand that you do have to risk much more of your account in order to make any decent amount, right? But as you grow bigger, you want to scale back your percentage as well. So let's say if you have a six-figure account, then I would say anywhere from 1% to 3% or even to 5%, right? But since you have about $5,000 account, I would say, you know, 5 to 7% max 10% Per trade. Now, the next thing I would say is to plan out your exit scenarios thoroughly so you know exactly what to do when each scenario happens and you don't get taken by surprise. Next, I would say to use a combination of different strategies that is bullish, bearish, and neutral. So you said that you got hit hard during the downturn. So chances are that you probably only put on bullish strategies. So if you want to have a proper portfolio, a holistic portfolio, then you want to consist your portfolio of you know different strategies right you want to have bullish strategies bearish strategies as well as neutral strategies and for this you can just simply just lean onto the spreads right for example bullish is bull put spread bearish would be bear call spread and neutral would be the iron condor and finally i would say to use vertical diversification so vertical diversification is basically the opposite of horizontal diversification so horizontal diversification is what most people do they will put on you know the one strategy maybe let's say for example they want to put on the bull put spread what they'll do is that they will scan through all the different stocks and then just put on you know the bull put spread but what happens is that when the market crashes all your positions are going to be hit right because you put it all roughly around the same time right so when the market crash they all tend to move in tandem so rather than putting on horizontal diversification you also want to add on what i call vertical diversification where we enter different strategies based on the price levels right different price levels then we enter either a bullish bearish or neutral trade so again i've already created a video on this this is uh, on my channel right the title is my secret strategy review so you can go ahead and watch that video all right question two is from anthony 
Akili. So his question is how I manage a losing credit spread that is past 21 days. So again, very good question. So if you've been following my channel for quite some time now, then you would know that I don't really like to hold my positions past 21 DTE. And the main reason is that exiting at 21 DTE will always yield a better long-term results than holding to expiration, right? So as you can see down here, this is the studies done by the Tasty Trade. And this is for the put spread. And as you can see, if you hold to expiration, right your performance and your average loss is going to be much uh, worse than if you were to exit it at 21 dte right so as you can see down here the annual return for exiting at 21 dte is much better and your losses is controlled much better as well so that is why you know i don't really like to hold past 21 dte now if you still insist on holding past 21 dte then there are two options that you can choose well, first of all, is if the spread is out of the money, at the money or in the money by a little bit, but the price is nearer to where your short strike is, then you can choose to roll out to a further DTE extending the life of the trade. So for example, if this is the price, and let's say if the price is either here, right, this is out of the money, O, this is at the money, A, and then this is in the money. So I would say in the money slightly where it's closer to where this uh, short put is, it's in the money. So during this time, at any point, you are still able to roll out to a further date for a credit, right? So this is how you can extend the live. And hopefully if the market goes back up, you still can make on the trade. Now, one thing to understand is that if you roll out to a further DTE, what you're essentially doing is closing out the existing trade. So you will actually be closing out the existing trade for a loss, and then you put on a new trade. So now this new trade will have a lower probability because right now it's closer to where the market is, but you will have a what do you call a higher premium compared to the previous one, right? But if you net it off both together, basically in a way, what you're doing is that you're just slightly reducing the risk on the overall trade and you hope the market goes back up. But if the market still continues to go down, then you will still have to sustain losses on this trade. So remember, there is no way for us to avoid losses, right? You will have winners, you have losses as well. And this is just part and parcel of trading. What you just need to know is that again, over the long term, if you go according to the proper mechanics, then you can still be profitable. Now, what if it's deeper in the money where it's now closer to where your long put strike is down here, right? If it's closer to where it is and you still insist on holding past 21 DTE, then there really is not much you can do, right? The only thing that you can do is still hold on to the spread and in which case you will actually risk getting assigned because right now this short put is in the money. And as time passes, the extrinsic value down here will slowly start to decrease. This is where you could get a sign on your short put and you end up with 100 shares. And if you do not have the funds, then guess what? You may get a margin call. So what again I do suggest is that you might want to just exit at 21 DTE take that loss, you know, move on to the next trade. And finally, do watch my videos on managing credit spreads on my channel. So there are two that you want to look out for. So just look out for this uh, two thumbnails uh, on my channel. Go ahead and watch them. Moving on to question three is by Donald Phelps. So his question is, Davis, how often do you adjust your delta neutral positions to get back to neutral after a move in the underlying? For example, if you had a 60-day iron condor, would you roll a wing after a week, two weeks, 10 days, etc.? So Donald, this is a very good question. So what Donald here is saying is regarding, you know, maintaining a delta neutral position, which is delta close to zero, right? So let's say, for example, you put on an iron condor, right? So this is the iron condor position. So let's say, for example, when you first put on the position, it's somewhere around zero delta, right? Let's just assume that it's at zero delta. Now, let's say after some time, let's say, for example, a week, the market starts to move and now it has come down slightly from where you put on the position at first. And maybe right now it's showing something like 20 deltas already. So at this point, you're no longer delta neutral because it's no longer at zero. So what Donald is suggesting is that, you know, you can just adjust one of your wings. For example, you could bring down your call spread down and then making this a little bit more delta neutral because when you bring this down you bring in more bearish delta so right now your 20 deltas could now become somewhere around five deltas after you have you know roll your this uh, call spread down 
So the question is, how often do I do that? So for me personally, I generally don't roll unless either of my short strikes get tested. And the reason is because I don't want to reduce the profit zone of my iron condor as much as possible and potentially get whipsawed, right? So for example, again, this is the iron condor construct. So let's say for example, the market comes down down here and assuming you want to make it to delta neutral, so to make it delta neutral, generally what you would do is to roll this call spread down. So when you roll it down right now, your strikes are going to be much closer to where the current market price is. And I don't really like this mainly again because you are reducing the profit zone. So you notice previously this was your profit zone. It's much wider, right? But because you want to have a delta neutral position, when you roll down this uh, iron condor as the market goes down, what happens now is that you have a smaller profit zone. So imagine this, if you keep doing this over and over again, as long, you know, imagine if the market keeps going down again and you keep shifting your this uh, call spread down, your spread or rather the profit zone is going to get tighter and tighter to the point whereby, you know, you could get easily whipsawed as well. Because what if the market suddenly rebounded? If the market rebounded, then what would you do, right? Would you move up the put spread then? If you move up the put spread then just to get a delta neutral, in the end, it's going to be so tight that you can hardly even profit. Yes, you kind of mitigate the risk a little bit, but then also it makes it very difficult for you to profit. So that is why for me, I will basically just roll it, the untested side, only once either side has been tested, right? But if you want to be aggressive with managing your positions, then yes, you could. And you want to fix it at, you know, X days or weeks. So again, there is no fixed rule, hard and fast rule that it has to be, you know, a fixed certain number of days. This is something that is up to you. All right, question four is by Bernard Boyd and JS. So uh, basically, they both have a question respectively, which is pretty much the same. So that is why I want to put them in this question. So the question is for a $100,000 account, given the current market, how much would you allocate to a put credit spread strategy, an iron condor strategy, and a negative delta strategy, which one and cash? And the other question is, if I have a small account of $10,000, I got from your videos that I should risk maximum 5% per trade. That said, how much of the total account should I allocate to be in trades? How much should I keep in cash? So again, very good questions. So this question has got to do with capital allocation. All right. So my answer is that for each strategy, you should allocate based on your capital allocation per trade, roughly, you know, one to 5%, right? The max being five to 7%, right? On any single trade. Now, how much should you actually allocate in total for your portfolio? Then this is where you want to use this table as a guideline, right? So as you can see down here, if the VIX is low, roughly 10 to 15, then you should have a max of 25% of your total capital being allocated, which means at this point, you have 75% in cash, right? So I'm just put somewhere down here where you say cash. And on the other hand, if the volatility is very high, then the maximum allocation you want to put into trades with 50%, which also means that you want to leave 50% in cash all right so basically you want to still leave aside sufficient cash so that you know whenever there is a drawdown or when your position you know have multiple losers in a row where it's not uncommon then at least you still have some cash to fight back you know in the long run so again remember this is a game for the long term you don't want to risk so big that you know you could lose everything just in a number of trades, right? So again, you want to adhere to proper risk management and follow this table in terms of the capital allocation. Now, question five is by Alex Tree. So Alex says, Hi, Davis. Good morning to you from Malaysia. I've been thinking if someone dealing with short strangle with unlimited risk, was there in any history or time the stocks can jump exponentially and exceed either the call or put side and cause a huge loss besides using spread and turn short strangle to short iron condor any way to prevent such a risk i hope you can understand what i'm trying to say because even if i use good pop win rate there will be certain percentage i'll be surprised with huge loss which i intended not to experience it it's two costly lessons to pay so alex this is a very good question and i definitely understand what you're trying to say so i want to share with you some data and statistics that is done by the tasty trade team so whenever we want to talk about you know uh, losses and performance and risk as well as win rate we always want to lean on statistics rather than what we think right because we want to be objective rather than subjective so down here as you can see this is a study done by the tasty trade team on the one standard deviation strangle now they have already boxed out to show you how the strangle will actually perform when the market crashed in 2008 
So as you can see, in 2008, there has been a very big move and it went way past, of course, the put side and that's where you have losses. So one thing to uh, understand is that it's not really possible to prevent such a risk totally, right? Because you will still be hit because nobody knows when the crash is going to come, right? And when it comes, you just need to know that over time, as you can see down here, over time from this point all the way to here, in the end, the market did recover and then you are still in profit again. All right. So again, first thing to understand is that while you may still take losses over the long run, you can still be profitable. Now I'm going to show you another data right now, which is even more interesting because now it comes to risk because down here we see that, hey, it's very scary, right? You see the market when it crashed, your strangle also lost a lot. But how much do you exactly lose? So this is not something that is like a question mark that you have no idea how much you're going to lose. In fact, you can know how much you're going to lose and you can be prepared up front for that. So here is a table to show you right at expiration, what is the probability of loss exceeding the BPR and what is the max loss when you actually have this loss? What's the max loss as a multiple of BPR on the right hand side of this column? Right. So BPR basically stands for buying power reduction. And what it means is basically it's just the collateral or the capital that's being tied up for putting up the position, right? So let's say, for example, if you put up a position and the BPR, it says it's $2,000. And that means that $2,000 will be helped by the broker to put on that strangle trade. All right. So let's just say that, you know, the BPR is $2,000. Okay. So down here, you can see that these are all the different underlyings. Now let's take a look at two specific underlyings. So first, let's take a look at SPY. As you can see, SPY is an index ETF. So the probability of loss exceeding the BPR, that means this amount when you first put on is actually 0.9%, which is less than 1%. So that means the chances of you actually losing more than this $2,000 is only 1%, right? Less than 1%. Now, the question is, how much exactly do you lose? So down here, you can see down here, it says 1.6 times. So basically, it's 1.6 times of $2,000. So that is roughly $3,200, right? So you already know that there'll be 1% of the time that you're going to lose roughly $3,200 uh, as the max risk, okay? So this is for SPY. Now, let's take a look at Amazon. Now, Amazon is 2.6 times the probability of loss. So now you have a higher chance of losing more than, you know, this BPR they put up for the trade. And how much more? As you can see down here, it says 3.1x, which means to say it's more than $6,000 on Amazon. So you can see down here, right, for SPY, let's say, for example, if the BPR is $2,000, then the max loss you're going to have is 3.2K and it's less than 1% of the time that's going to happen. But if you're going to put on individual stocks, like for example, Amazon, then it's going to happen much more often, 2.6%, and your risk is going to be much more when you lose that amount. So what's the moral of the story down here? Basically, stick with index ETFs if you want to trade strangle. Now, here's another more important finding, and that is what if you exit at 21 DTE instead? Now you notice that if you exit at 21 DTE instead, all of a sudden for SPY, the probability of loss exceeding your BPR is actually now 0%. That means, let's say for example, if the BPR is $2,000 again, it means to say at no point will you actually lose $2,000 or more. So you already know what is going to be the max risk when you put on this strangle, right? Even though there's going to be a crash, you know that this $2,000 is not going to exceed it because based on the statistic, you're not actually going to you know, hit this BPR. In fact, how much are you going to hit? It says only 0.6 times, right? So that is much lesser than $2,000. That's about $1,200. So from here, if you exit at 21 DTE, you already have reduced your risk significantly. Now, as for Amazon, as you can see down here, the risk has been reduced significantly as well from 2.6% to 1.1%. But then again, you know, there's still, you know, a pretty big risk because also you notice what is the max loss? It's 2.8x, which means to say, you know, it's close to $6,000 still in terms of your loss. So again, you cannot prevent such risk but how do you mitigate or reduce the risk? And that is by going with index ETFs and as well as exiting at 21 DTE. 
Now, I want to share with you another study, and this time this is on iron condors. Now, I know you did not really specifically talk about iron condors, but I want to share with this, you know, with the rest of the folks who are interested in trading iron condors. So iron condors is very similar as well. So as you can see down here, let's say, for example, your long wing delta, that means to say this is where you buy the options, right? Either the buy, buying the call option or buying the put option as the protection, right? So this is the wing part. So this is for 13 delta. And they do it all the way to 5 delta. So if you were to exit at expiration, you notice that the probability of actually hitting the max loss on your iron condor is 6.4% for 13 delta wing and 5 delta wing is 1.2%. So basically, if your wing is pretty wide, the chances of you, you know, hitting that max loss is pretty low. Now, here's the cool part. What if you exit at 21 DTE? If you exit at 21 DTE, you notice that everything has been reduced to under 1%. So here again, the moral of the story is exit at 21 DTE and that will help you reduce your risk. Question number six is by John Nickel. By the way, if you like this video so far, please subscribe and also click the thumbs up button and also do get your free copy of the Options Income Blueprint where I share the top three option strategies that help you generate a consistent income each month trading just one to two hours a day, right? So if you want to go ahead to get this copy, just head on over to optionswithdavis.com slash blueprint. All right, back to the video. And John Nichols says, if I have a iron condor on and the price drops close or past credit put strike, would it make sense to buy back call spread if it reaches 50 or 75% of call side combined premium receive? And same thing in reverse, if price reaches credit call strike, all right, so this is a very good question, right? So basically what John is saying is this, right? Let's say, for example, the market has gone, you know, all the way down here, right? So let's say it has gone past your put strike down here, your put spread down here. Should you just close out this call spread and leave this put spread on? If, you know, if most of the uh, profit, I think 50 or 75%, of the call side combined premium has been received well basically the answer is yes you can do that right if you are very confident the fact that the market can actually bounce back up then you can do that right you'll be making on both sides because you already took off the call spread for a profit and then as the market bounces back up your put spread will be out of the money and then you can close this as well and then you have made on both sides now the downside to this strategy is that what if the market actually continues to go down instead of going up Right, and because this time you have already closed off your call credit spread, this call credit spread cannot help further mitigate you know the losses that you sustain on the downside. Because if you have kept this spread on, then there's still some credit left whereby you will still be making you know on this position, right? Maybe if you close off at roughly 50%, there's still another 50% that you can still take out of this call spread as the market goes down. And basically, this whole position will not lose as much. Okay, so this is the drawdown of this uh, method so that is why i prefer to actually just keep it on as a package and take it off as a package so unless you're good at technical analysis and you think that the market is really going to turn then you can take it off right you can take off the call spread but otherwise you know i would just leave it on and just close out everything as a whole okay question seven is by enrico sekagiani uh, i hope i pronounced your last name correctly if i haven't please forgive me Right, so Enrico says, Hi Davis, I prepared several programs to check for potential assignment risk. I assume that if there are fewer than 21 days until expiration and the extrinsic value is less than 50 cents, it is better to close the position. Some argue that the danger only occurs in the last week, but I was assigned as 14 days to expiration. I believe there's no sure way to avoid assignment. Theoretically, every short option can be assigned. The folks at Tasty Trade suggest rolling the position at 21 DTE. However, I think it might be better to let the extrinsic value decrease and maintain the position, especially if the option is at the money or out of the money. What are your thoughts? So Enrico, this is a very, very good question. And this question has got to do with assignments. All right, so here's my answer. Firstly, you are right. And as mentioned in many of my assignment videos on my channel, the biggest risk of early assignment is when your extrinsic value is very little, right? So it does not really have that much to do with the time left because if you have very little extrinsic value, let's say, for example, you only have 10 cents left in extrinsic value on your short option, but there is still 100 or more days left in the option lifespan, guess what? Then you can still get assigned, right? Because there's no longer any incentive for the option buyer to hold on to the trade. 
And second thing is, yes, there's no sure way to avoid assignment, but you can reduce the risk of early assignment. So that is why the Tasty Trade actually suggested to roll at 21 DTE, because over the long run, 21 DTE still get a better performance as I showed you know, in the earlier slides. And at the same time, most of the time at 21 DTE, there should be some extrinsic value left so that you know the chances of getting early assigned is not that high. But again, it really depends on how deep in the money your that short option is if it's very deep in the money then again no matter how long the time is and there's very little extrinsic value you're still going to get a sign now secondly as for holding past 21 dte if it's out of the money or at the money yes you could do that right because i can certainly understand where you're coming from because after all your spread could be still out of the money right so there's no real reason to panic and you can just let the extrinsic value you know just decay slowly over time but the bigger question and more important question you have to ask is whether does it actually give you a better long-term result? So again, as you can see down here, these are the statistics uh, study already done by the uh, Tasty Trade team, right? For spreads as well for iron condors, you can see that 21 DTE is much more superior in the performance than holding all the way to expiration. So if you really want to still hold on to this position past 21 DTE because it's out of the money or it's at the money, then what I would suggest is to actually run empirical tests to actually compare your theory so that it is actually objective and by objective i mean it's actually based on statistics right solid statistics that you can look at and say that hey objectively this is better than exiting at 21 dte and you want to do it over at least 100 plus trades right you want to do it over 100 or even more trades even better because the more sample size that you have then the more accurate the results is going to be now this is much better than you know being subjective where you think it's better right because a lot of people can just say you know i think it's better to just you know hold on to it because it's out of money but at the end of the day the best thing you want to do is always always have tests and back it up with statistics so again you'll be objective rather than be subjective so question eight is by bill molly bill asks i would ask why spreading out the strikes reduce the risk in a credit spread you mentioned this once in a video but can you please clarify this concept more absolutely all right so i'm going to present you with two different spreads down here and again the concept for you know spreading out your strikes or widening out your spread is actually safer then tightening, you know, having a tighter spread is only if you apply, you know, risk per trade, right? Basically, you apply your capital allocation risk per trade. So let's say, for example, you can risk $700 per trade. Now, if you can risk $700 per trade, there are a few ways that you can actually construct your trade, right? So the very first option, what you can do is that you can have two times a $5 wide bull put spread. Right? So if you have two times a $5 bull put spread, your total credit would be, let's say, $3 and your max risk is $7. So based on, you know, this is $700 in risk, right? So the important thing is that your max risk stays the same. Now, option two is that instead of going for two bull put spread, you can actually just go for one bull put spread and this time you widen out the spread right so if you widen out the spread and let's say for example this is a nine dollar wide bull put spread you receive a total credit of two dollars which means to say your max risk is seven dollars and again your max risk is now seven hundred dollars so when it comes to total risk per trade they are both the same right because equally they are both seven hundred dollars now in terms of which one is riskier we now have to take a look at where you know the max risk is going to be hit at expiration where depending on where the market goes right so for example now you have the two times five dollar wide bull put spread down here where your long option is somewhere at 177.5 so if the market comes down here and it closes the expiration how much do you lose for this spread well basically you lose everything right because you have risked 700 dollars for it and it's already gone past your this uh, long put option you're going to lose $700. Now, what if, for example, it closes at the same place, but this time you have the $9 spread. Now, for the $9 spread, you do not actually lose the max risk, right? You do not lose the full $700. In fact, you lose lesser than that. And the reason is because it did not hit the max risk, right? Your max risk is all the way past this long put down here. 
So since it did not go past this long put, you do not actually lose as much as compared to you know having two bull put spread with tighter spread. So that is why I say that you know if you widen out this width, it's actually less riskier than you have you know tighter spread for this uh, bull put spread. So which one is better? Again, this is a trade-off. So the trade-off is that for the $5 wide bull put spread, if you have two contracts of that, you have more credit, that means you get a higher return. But then again, it's easier for you to hit the max loss. Whereas for the $9 wide, you get lesser credit, but it's much harder for you to lose you know, the max risk. So again, which one you want to go for, it's really up to you which one you want to prioritize. You want to prioritize a higher return, then you go for the one with two times $5 wide bull put spread. If you want to prioritize you know your risk management whereby you want a spread that is less riskier you do not hit your max risk that easily then you want to go for the one times nine dollar wide bull put spread so hopefully bill this has answered your question so question number nine is by joshua logan so joshua i know you have you know asked quite a number of questions and i only can pick one so i pick this one because it's the closest uh, one that is uh, related to spreads right so your question is hey davis thanks so much for asking you are my go-to for everything options not only do you make it funny you explain the concepts really really well uh, thank you joshua for that very very kind word i really appreciate you uh, I've done a handful of 45 to 60 DTE, but the premium is low. I must be picking the wrong strikes. I'm doing 5 to 10 wide spreads. What is your average premium per trade? So again, this is a very, very good question. So here's my answer. So generally, I would aim for at least 20% premium on the spread width. So for example, I aim for around a dollar premium for a $5 wide spread. And if you're going for, let's say, a $10 wide spread, then that would be somewhere around $2, right? So 20% of the total spread width. Now, one thing to understand is that the premium is also affected by the volatility. So in a very low volatility environment, which is roughly where we are in right now as of this recording, what you will find is that you will get lesser premium than you usually would. And in a higher volatility, you will get higher premium. So at the end of the day, you know, you have to ask yourself, if you get only, you know, 90 cents or 80 cents credit, do you still want to put on the trade? And if you feel that, you know, that's not a risk you want to take, then you want to skip the trade, right? Alternatively, what you want to do is you might want to push the strikes closer to where the market is because also the uh, premium which you receive has got to do with how close your strikes are to where the current market price is. So for example, if this is where the current market price is and you compare two different put spreads, if this put spread down here is closer to where the current market price is, then you're definitely naturally going to get a higher credit compared to this spread down here where it's much further away. So generally, the higher the delta of your short strike, the higher your overall premium and the lower the delta of your short strike, the lower your overall premium. So hopefully, Joshua, I hope I have answered your question. Now, the last and final question is by Brent Cole. And his question is, knowing what strategy to use and when. Uh, for example, I have an iron condo trade on for SPY, market neutral. It started at 45 DTE. It is now at 29 DTE and the market has fallen. I can't roll the trade for a credit, but there are other trades I can put on that help offset the loss if the iron condo ends up losing. But I don't know what trades I would put on in succession of the iron condo to protect against market swings up or down. So Brent, this is also a very good question and a pretty loaded one, right? So there are many facets to this. So first of all, I would say just watch the video which I have on my channel. It's called The Ultimate Guide to Option Strategy Selection. Basically, this will answer the first part of your question of knowing what strategy to use and when. So in this video, I go in depth into the strategies that will be suitable for you based on your account size as well as your experience and when to put them on, right? So go and watch that video. Now, for the second part of your question, you talked about the iron condor, right? Where you mentioned that you cannot roll for a credit because the market has fallen. So here's the thing. As the market falls down and test the put side, you actually can roll for a credit. And it's not to roll out, but rather it is to roll the call spread side down. Because when you roll the call spread side down closer to the market, you can get a credit for this iron condor. So when you roll it down, basically it will be looking like this now you have a tighter spread of course 
But what you have done is that you have kind of mitigated a little bit of the risk to the downside, right? Because you've collected a little bit more credit. And as long as you keep the width, the spread width the same for the call spread as you shift it down, then your overall risk is going to reduce as well by the amount of credit you receive, okay? So you can actually just roll it down for a credit. Uh, but one thing you need to understand as well, as I mentioned in the earlier slide, if you were to roll it down, you'll be reducing the max profit zone, but it's definitely fine as well because by then, you know, at least if the market continues to go down, you have reduced your risk on the downside. Now, finally, I would also suggest to watch my video. So there are two videos I would point you to. And the first one is the complete beginner's guide to managing losing iron condors. And the second one is the ultimate guide to turn losing iron condors into winners. So basically in these two videos, I cover everything there is on the different scenarios of what you will face when you're trading an iron condor. So I'll share with you, you know, if the market goes down, what do you do? And also where do you roll it to if you choose to roll? Or if the market goes up, what do you do? When do you exit? When do you take profit? When do you take loss so it's very comprehensive go ahead and watch the video if you haven't so all right guys these are the 10 questions i hope that you know i've covered most of the questions that you guys have asked if i haven't i apologize because again i have so many people emailing me and if you really like this you know please at least leave in the comments below tell me that you liked it give me a thumbs up and i may even consider doing a second part to this video to answer even more questions that you have by the way if you like this video then you're absolutely going to love this next video which I have for you so go ahead and watch that video right now also if you haven't already gotten your free copy of the options income blueprint you can do so just by clicking this link down here on your screen and you'll be able to get it for free all right I will see you in the next video